Uh, my name is Bang Chen. I'm the chair of the MIT Seminar Series over here. And today uh, it's a great honor uh, to welcome uh, Professor Frank DiSalvo uh, to give us a, a, a seminar on materials challenges in polymer electrolyte fuels. Uh, let me just uh, uh, give a very brief uh, introduction to uh, uh, Professor uh, DiSalvo. Uh, he's uh, currently John Newman Professor of Physical Science at Cornell University. And he's director of Cornell Center for Sustain Sustainable Future and co-director for Center for Advanced Technologies. And uh, he had uh, initiated uh, actually several other centers uh, at uh, Cornell, uh, which I'm not going to uh, uh, say one by one. Uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Science, a fellow of uh, APS and the MRS. He uh, served uh, on the Department of Energy, Basic Energy Science Advisory Committee and has also co-authored more than 450 papers. I remember last time we met was actually in one of the DOE uh, 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 media visitors uh, for basic energy science, uh, who uh, say, I think uh, Frank chaired that uh, uh, visit. Uh, so uh, uh, Professor DiSavo received his bachelor degree from here, physics, uh, and uh, his PhD uh, uh, in the West Coast, uh, Stanford University, 1971. And following that, he joined the uh, uh, Bell Lab uh, as uh, say, uh, and then we, he worked on CARE 1986 as uh, uh, different positions, including uh, led several research departments. And then he joined the Colel Chemistry Department, a lot of interesting history there, uh, in 1986, and the rest uh, is the history. And today we'll listen to uh, the uh, story from uh, Professor Bissau. That's what you well, well, welcome. Thank you, Gen. Thank you all for coming. Can everybody hear me? No problem? Good. Oh, I'm coming up now. All right. Um, so what I wanted to do was to start off by painting as big a frame as I possibly could. And I wanted to start with this word sustainability or sustainable future and frame everything in the sustainable future. By the way, I might point out here that this is not all my group. This is a collaborative group that's been working on fuel cell technologies and science since about uh, 2003 and has now recently been enlarged to an energy frontier research center that includes also battery work and whatever. Uh, but it's clearly, it's the students and the postdocs that really get everything done. Everybody knows professors don't really do anything. We shuffle paper and things like that. But it's the students who really do things. Uh, and so I wanted to start off acknowledging them right from the beginning. So let me take a step way back and talk about sustainability for a minute and say that sustainability is really the main challenge for humanity that we're facing this century. And from my point of view, sustainability has three grand themes in it. And the, the three grand themes are energy, environment, and economic development. And there are a whole bunch of terms up here that you can read through. I don't need to read them all. The point of looking at all of this is that when you start uh, looking at some details, for example, water, which is important for the environment, important for the ecosystem services of providing pure water, clean water. You can't have economic development without water and managing water for agriculture, for example. And you can't have energy without water because we use water for cooling energy because most of our energy systems are, are heat systems and most of the heat ends up as waste heat and we have to get rid of it somehow. So the point of this is that these three big themes are strongly interconnected and interdependent. So if you're really going to make progress in, in the sustainability for the planet, you really have to address this as a holistic system issue. Okay, So each one of us might need a little specialty to be working in some part of sustainability, but unless we pull it all together as looking at it as a giant system, or maybe even a system of systems, uh, we're not likely to get to where we need to get to this century. And all of this challenge is certainly uh, made more urgent by the fact that we can anticipate that the world population is going to increase to maybe 10 billion or so around 2050, that world energy demand will be doubled, that world food demand is likely to be more than doubled, that we're going to have big problems with supplying fresh water uh, and so on and so on on the planet. If we don't do this in a holistic way, we will not make it. Okay, now let's barrel in a little bit toward energy. 
uh, and look at energy use in the U.S. Actually, energy use patterns worldwide are about the same. Uh, and this is just a little graph that shows you where our energy sources come from up here. Not surprisingly, you all should know that something like 85% of our energy comes from some form of fossil fuel, gas, oil, or coal. Uh, but they are used for different things. So the colors down here tell you what it's used for. Not a surprise that oil, for example, is primarily used in the transportation sector of our economy, and that nuclear and coal is primarily used to generate electricity for the economy. There is a small amount of renewables in this mix, mainly that's hydropower. There's not much bio or wind power or whatever in the U.S., nor is there much in the world, although there, it's growing exponentially. It still has a very long way to go to make a significant impact. So let me just make a few points about looking over here at oil, because that'll connect to what I want to talk about in fuel cells. So the first thing is that world oil production is around 85 million barrels of oil uh, per day. It's gone down a little bit with the recession. It's been a little bit higher. It will go higher. It's picking up already because we're coming out of the, the Great Recession. Uh, of that 86 million barrels, the U.S. consumes about 20 million barrels. So it's a, a little less than a quarter of the oil. But we only produce about 8.5 million barrels a day. That means that we have to import about $12 million per day. So current price is not 80, but 85 barrels, roughly, $85 a barrel. That's about $350 billion a year. And of course, the way we get that oil is we borrow money, we burn the oil, and then we pay interest on it forever. It's not a sustainable economic plan. We, cannot, we will not be doing this in 2050. Something is going to change between now and 2050. And we're not managing that transition at all. It's not a sustainable way to do anything. Nobody's business plan, borrowing money and burning it, would survive as long as it has uh, up till now in the US, except that we were, a we were a large economic power and are not any longer. So this is going to change relatively soon. By the way, 86 million barrels of oil a day is an amazing industry. Probably the, the, the biggest wonder of the world is the energy business and 86 million barrels a day. A barrel is 42 gallons of oil, maybe this big and this tall. Nobody ships in, in barrels. But if you took 86 million barrels standing up on the end and you put them in a row, <clears throat> it would circle the equator. You should do the math. It's kind of interesting to prove it would circle the equator. And we do that every single day. That's an absolutely amazing industry. It works amazingly well. Uh, there are, of course, challenges with all of that. And I've outlined one of them. One of them is economic. <laughs> Uh, oil imports in the U.S. account for 60% of the use. It's about equal to the use in the transportation sector. So the big strategic worry is that if the imports were shut off for economic or strategic reasons, uh, the whole country would come to a halt. So this is a major strategic problem. So that's, that's, a, that's a very big challenge. And it's one of the reasons that the Department of Energy is mainly focused on this problem, not on producing more nuclear, although it's going to happen. Okay, So on how do we figure out this problem? OK, so let's look at energy consumption. If we take energy that's being consumed uh, on the planet in a given year and divide by the time in a year, the number of seconds in a year, we get the average power consumption uh, of the world in watts, since it's uh, energy per time. It's about 14 terawatts is the average energy consumption on the planet. That's such a big number that it's hard for a person to relate to it. So if you divide by the number of people on the planet and ask what that amounts to, it amounts to 2,100 watt light bulbs per person, man, woman, and child, on the planet burning continuously 24 hours a day. Okay. Now, put that in comparison. Each one of us, on average, is a 100 watt light bulb. So the energy that you expend in a day is, is a 100 watt light bulb. That's what it takes to keep you going. So we are all magnified in our efforts by 21 times overall on the planet. However, most people on the planet don't have access to that 20, uh, 21 light bulbs. In fact, most of those light bulbs are, not surprisingly, here in the US, we consume about a quarter of the world's power consumption at the moment. Uh, and per person in the U.S., it's about 110 100-watt light bulbs per person in the U.S. 
that's a huge power consumption. Thinking of a person as 100 watt in energy, it would be equivalent to, in past societies, having 110 slaves each working for you. Okay, that's, that's a good way to think about it. We got 110 people working for us. It comes in the form of fossil fuel rather than the form of a human body. Uh, and so that's a, that's a big challenge. That's a lot of energy and it's slated on the planet probably to double by 2050. And it's not clear where that's all gonna come from. But there's gonna be demand for it, it looks like. The annual growth in power consumption is about 2.5% a year. It took a little dip in the reception, but it's coming, coming back fast. Again, I already said something like 28 terawatts is what people expect. Some people expect more. It really depends on the growing economies on the planet, China and India in particular, how fast power consumption is going up there and how fast the standard of living rises. But the, the long, there's no real long-term planning. How are we going to get from here to there? We're just making it up as we go along. It's not a very sensible way to do things. Okay, so now how about oil? If we come to the oil, right now, uh, most of the oil production is easy oil in places like the Middle East. Two thirds of the oil on the planet comes from the Middle East. The production on the planet comes from the Middle East. You drill a hole in the ground, you produce the oil at about a dollar a barrel. You sell it for $85 a barrel. They're not a bad business to be in. If I could get in that business, I'd be in it. Uh, but that production is estimated to peak, depends on what experts you talk to. Some think it's peaking now. Some think 10 years, some think 20 years. A few think 50 years. But certainly in the lifetime of most of the students and postdocs in this room, easy oil is gonna peak. Then the oil that's gonna be left is gonna be much harder oil coming from tar sands and shale oils. It's much more polluting to develop it, and it's much more costly. It costs about $50 a barrel to develop the tar sands in Alberta, in Canada. It produces two barrels of wastewater per gallon, uh, per barrel of oil that's produced, and that wastewater is sitting in huge lakes and lagoons that are so toxic that if birds land in it, they die. All right, this is not a good sustainable plan for the planet. But we gotta start thinking about how we're gonna deal with this. So we need, obviously, new energy sources, and we need more efficient energy sources, we think, uh, long term, most of the energy that we use, just like the energy we're using now, is going to come from the sun. The energy we're using now comes from the sun in the form of stored energy in the fossil fuel. In the future, uh, the sun is the only source that we know about that has the potential to supply, from our current perspective, almost unlimited energy. So the sun is where we're going to go, but we're going to need, if we do that, we're going to need to store energy on a massive scale, and some of that energy is going to have to be in the form of fuel because some things, at least as far as we can tell, things like airplanes aren't gonna run on batteries. You're gonna need high energy density fuel. Things like heavy uh, duty equipment and trucks, heavy duty trucks are gonna need fuel because the energy density is much higher than anything else we know how to do. Uh, and we might wanna just generate that fuel to store sunlight for times when we're in low energy production periods in the winter uh, in low sunlight days and things of that sort. And so we're gonna, we're gonna have to convert probably something like 25% of the, of the so-called renewable energy or sun energy or whatever it's coming from to some kind of fuel for storage. So that now leads us eventually to fuel cells. So let's see how we get the fuel cells out of all of this. So let's look at, at fuel cells. So I already said, we already said this, we're gonna need it for those reasons. If we're, gonna, if we're gonna actually make fuels and store them in some way, we certainly wanna use those fuels as efficiently as we possibly can. And if we're just gonna use those fuels for heating, we're already there. Because if you have a natural gas furnace at home and you have a modern natural gas furnace, 95% of the enthalpy of combustion ends up in the house and 5% goes out with the exhaust. You can put your hand on the exhaust pipe and not burn your hand. It's a PVC pipe typically, it's not a great thermal conductor. On the other hand, it's not very hot. So all that heat ends up in the house. We know how to do that quite well. That's not the problem. The problem is if we're going to convert the energy from one form to another, typically from heat or typically from, in fossil fuel case, from stored chemical energy through combustion to make heat and then transform it into motion or electricity, then we are limited by Carnot to an efficiency which is unacceptably low uh, so the, the hottest temperature that we can be running the process at reliably versus the 
temperature bath at which we are rejecting heat to, right now the best automotive engines we can make are about 30% efficient. Uh, so that means 70% of the heat goes out the tailpipe or out the radiator. So we're throwing a lot of that energy away. Electrical energy in the U.S. is about 35% efficient. 65% is, is going out to the environment. Predicted maximum from material scientists who say, well, maybe someday we could have materials that go to this, this highest temperature and they may last long enough. Maybe we could get to 50%. That's the absolute upper limit for what people think is going to be likely with, with uh, just given the periodic table as the starting point. So here's where fuel cells come in. In principle, fuel cells could reach 100% efficiency. I'm cheating here a little bit. Not 100% of the enthalpy, but 100% of the free energy could be converted to electrical energy. The difference is delta H, T delta S, as you might remember from thermodynamics. That, uh, in, uh, in some fuel cells, that difference can be as large as 10% or so. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, in principle, it's the only energy conversion technology that we know about that can take chemical energy and turn it into to electrical energy and avoid the Carnot limit because it's not a heat engine, okay? So when I say in principle, we're going to spend most of the rest of the seminar talking about what's limiting us to reach the 100% or get as close to the 100% as we need. And we'll see how close we've actually gotten at present. So that's why fuel cells. So we started with this big funnel. We're trying to make the Earth sustainable. We said we'll focus on the energy part. We got to efficiency and fuel cells. Now that's the motivation. Okay, so where do we go? So let's look at a fuel cell. There are lots of different potential fuel cell technologies. Uh, fuel cells were invented in 1830-something, six. They've been around a long time, but they've never been technical, technologically realized on a grand scale. They've been used in the space shuttle program. That was the first real adaptation of fuel cells. It turns out fuel cells are hard. It's a hard problem. Why is it a hard problem? Here's an example. What's a fuel cell? A fuel cell is just like a battery. It has two electrodes, positive and negative electrode. In a battery, you put all the chemical reactants inside the cell, and then you use up those chemical reactants. If it's a primary battery, when it's dead, it's dead. You throw it away. If it's a secondary battery, you can put energy back in, reverse the chemical reaction, store the energy in the chemicals, and run the battery again until something fails in the battery. Maybe we can do that with good batteries a thousand times or so. A fuel cell <clears throat> is, is essentially a battery where you store the reactants outside and you feed them in to the reactor as you need them, okay? So it has two electrodes. It has an anode where oxidation takes place. Here's an example where the fuel being used is methanol. I'll tell you what fuels might be possible. It's a fuel cell that operates near room temperature. That's something that the Department of Energy is very interested in for the transportation sector, especially for personal transportation, because keeping a fuel cell, for example, other fuel cell technologies run hot. Keeping a fuel cell hot costs a lot of energy when you're not driving your car. So if you only drive a half an hour to work, well, in Boston, it's probably an hour commute, but an hour to work, and then the car sits there for eight hours, and then an hour home, you either have to heat up the fuel cell which takes too much time, or you have to keep it hot all the time, which wastes a whole bunch of energy. So nobody believes right now, no technologists believe that high temperature fuel cells are the way to go for, tech, for transportation, for other applications possibly. So here's something that might be used for transportation, operates near room temperature. You take in methanol, you combine it with water and pull those two molecules apart, make CO2, protons, and electrons. Now, you might think that's pretty simple. It's easy to write down. But you all know what happens if you take alcohol and water and you mix them together in a cup at room temperature. What happens? Nothing. There's no chemical reaction. Bonds don't rearrange. In order to rearrange bonds like that at room temperature, you need an exquisite catalyst. That reaction will go under the proper catalytic conditions. You can also make that reaction go at high enough temperatures, but we're not trying to work it at high temperatures. We're trying to work at low temperatures. And low temperatures is where the thermal activation is so poor that you need very good catalysts to make most chemical reactions work at, at room temperature. We have a catalyst that works eh, fair for this particular reaction. Uh, we need a much better catalyst for this reaction at room temperature. <clears throat> Nonetheless, those protons then move across the membrane as hydrated species. Electrons that are generated are collected up in the electrode, go through the external load, come over here 
to the cathode where the, the uh, hydrogen and oxygen are recombined to form water. So the final products are just CO2 and water, exactly the same as combusting uh, methanol, but no Carnot limit. Okay? The only heat that's produced is the T delta S heat in this reaction, small amount of heat. Now over here, this electrode, to make this reaction work at room temperature, the best catalyst we have right now is just platinum. It's a terrible catalyst, but it's the best we have. And I'll show you why it's a terrible catalyst in a minute. Nonetheless, this is the basic design of a fuel cell. Very simple in concept. To carry it out is very tough. Now, one of the reasons it's very tough is that these electrodes uh, up here are not a monolithic block. They're in fact a nanocomposite that must support three different functions. And so here's the three functions up here. You have to support three percolation networks. You need an electronic conducting network so that any electron that's produced over here can be gathered up and be brought out of the electrode and brought to this side of the electrode and brought to the right catalyst particle, so to speak, to combine with the oxygen and, and protons to produce water. You need another uh, network that allows ionic conduction because if a proton or H plus is produced over here, it has to be able to get to the membrane, through the membrane, and then disperse to this part of the electrode. So there has to be an ionic pathway all through this as well. And then finally, there has to be open porosity inside these electrodes so that the oxygen can get in, the fuel can get in, and the products can get out, okay? So this has to have three percolation networks, and this electrode really is a nanocomposite, and I've, a cartoon is over here. I'll show you a real picture a little later. The black particles represent what is used right now. Carbon black is used as the support for the catalyst and the, the conducting network that allows the conductivity, uh, the electrons to be gathered up and moved through the fuel cell. The ionic conductor is typically made out of the same material that the membrane's made out of, and that's the little blue particles here. Then the, the catalyst might be these particles, and then the open porosity is the little white space left in there. That's a cartoon, and it's not to scale. I'll show you what it looks like to scale. Uh, the nanoparticles that are in this, the catalyst particles, are very small, two to five nanometers. A nanometer is only about four platinum atoms across. So these things are you know, 20, 20 atoms across, really small particles. And that's done both to have uh, a large number of platinum at the surface of the nanoparticles because that's all that's active. The bulk doesn't do anything for the catalysis. It's just the surface. And platinum is expensive. So you want most of the platinum to be on the surface of something so you make nanoparticles. The other reason you make nanoparticles is that you need high power densities if you're going to use this for most applications. And the rate of chemical reaction is proportional just to the surface area of the catalyst. So whatever catalyst you have, whether it's platinum or not, you're going to want to use it as nanoparticles to get high reaction rates or high power densities. This is an empirical design, whoops, this is an empirical design that's, uh, that's put together like a paint formulation. You put all the pieces together, you add the right solvent, the right polymers and whatever, and you paint it on the membrane and then you pull the solvent out and if all the supports hold things together, it leaves the open porosity and whatever. So it's just a formulation and for each catalyst particle to work, that catalyst has to be connected to all three of these percolation networks, because if it's only connected to two or less, it doesn't function. It can't do one of the functions. So with this design, only about 25% of the catalyst is actually utilized. That's not very good. So what's, the re what's it really look like? What's this support really look like? The carbon black is this gray stuff in the back. The bright spots are the catalyst. That happens to be a catalyst, uh, a particular catalyst that we made, so we'll show you the picture later. But this is roughly what it looks like. You can see that the carbon black is kind of sintered together to produce this kind of open space between it. So it provides a scaffolding function as well to provide the open porosity. The problem is that the carbon black that's used presently corrodes too rapidly. It's not durable enough in fuel cells. So we'll talk about that a little bit in a bit. So here's a real fuel cell. GM fortunately has a fuel cell division in upstate New York, just south of Rochester in a little town called Honey Eye Falls. And there they make fuel cells that are about this, about as big as a car energy. They're 100 kilowatt fuel cells. The fuel cell uses hydrogen as a fuel and oxygen as an oxidizer. It uses enough hydrogen. It uses about one mole of hydrogen per second. How many of you remember from freshman chemistry how big a mole of hydrogen gas is at standard temperature and pressure? 
22.4 liters, remember that number? It's about like this. Uses that per second. If I, if I measure in a single uh, cell the potential as a function of the current I'm drawing from the cell, the current looks like this. On a linear scale, it starts off at this equilibrium potential when I'm drawing no current, right around 1.2 volts, so it's just like a standard battery potential more or less, under some following conditions up here. The potential drops like a stone as soon as you start drawing current, and it follows this orange curve down here, so that when I get to a current density of about an amp per square centimeter of electrode surface, so when I'm just looking at the electrode surface, I need to have currents that are high like this in order to have a high enough power density and make the fuel cell have a small enough mass that I can actually carry it around with me if I'm going to put it in a transportation vehicle. So I've got to operate this at very high power density and at that power density the potential that's available at the electrodes is about half of the equilibrium potential. So this is 50 percent efficient. Much better than an internal combustion engine but not good enough. It's not good enough because hybrid technology in the future may be able to reach that efficiency with the right kind of battery and uh, uh, diesel engine and whatever may reach about 50 percent. And since that's already an ongoing technology, this had better do better than that for anybody to invest in it. So it's not good enough. So we ask, why is that so bad? And the biggest reason has to do with this first step right here. This is the first contribution. That blue curve is the measured potential drop that comes from the fact that platinum is a terrible catalyst for oxygen reduction. It means that you have to put extra energy in to drive that reaction, that so-called overpotential. It's just an efficiency loss because it's a poor catalyst. And it's about one-third of the voltage that you have available. You're just throwing away because you've got a lousy catalyst. The other things are things that you can work with in engineering to, to minimize. Right now, this is just the ohmic loss and all the resistive paths inside the electrodes and the rest of the cell. And then there's so-called mass transport loss, which has to do with how the gas is getting in or how the fuel is getting in and how the products are getting out. Okay? That also is under engineering control. It turns out what we don't show up here is an overpotential for hydrogen oxidation, just for oxygen reduction, because platinum is a wonderful catalyst for hydrogen oxidation. It works ex very, very well as long as the hydrogen is squeaky clean, really clean, less than 10 parts per million of CO, less than one part per billion of sulfur. You get sulfur in there, binds to the surface of the platinum, catalyst is dead. So it has to be really clean. It's so good that the overpotential for hydrogen oxidation on this scale is essentially zero. It's about 10 millivolts at this current density. If we could find a catalyst for oxygen reduction that was as good as the catalyst we have for hydrogen oxidation and kept the same design technology at an amp per square centimeter, we'd be at about 90 percent efficient. Not bad. So there's the challenge, first challenge, much better catalyst for oxygen reduction. Lots of other challenges, I haven't, I haven't put up the numbers up here, lots of other challenges that we'll talk about, I won't go into them in detail, but this cell, this current cell, you'd say, well, we're close to there. No, the current cell, A, costs way too much, and B, it doesn't have the durability it needs. So I mentioned that the carbon black corrodes, and that's a big problem. Okay, so here's challenges. We already talked about this one. It's expensive, poor durability. The surface area, the particle size, grows with time, especially when the fuel cell potential is cycled, and that's a, that's a big problem. For those who know, that's Ostwald ripening that's occurring. Uh, the catalyst support I already mentioned is corroding, especially when you're cycling the fuel cell potential. Uh, we can only use, at room temperature, right now we only have catalysts that would allow us to use three different fuels, hydrogen, Formic acid, which you can think of as a CO2 carrier for hydrogen. Uh, this is a gas at room temperature. You can't make it into a liquid. This is a liquid at room temperature, so that's kind of nice. Uh, or methanol. Now, I mentioned that platinum is an excellent catalyst for hydrogen, but only if the hydrogen is very pure. If you try to use the other two fuels with uh, platinum, it doesn't work because on oxidizing the, the the organic fuel, it, you go through making carbon monoxide, and carbon monoxide sticks to platinum very strongly. So you're dead if you do that. 
So the best catalyst we have right now for these two uh, fuels, especially this one, is platinum ruthenium alloy, and it's not very good either. You lose 300 millivolts over potential at that. Now you've lost 300 plus 400 plus the other day, don't get much out at all. Okay, it's pretty lousy. We don't have any catalyst for oxidizing more complex fuels at, at uh, room temperature. We'd love to be able to break carbon-carbon bonds and oxidize that fuel up to so methanol or butanol. We'd love to be able to use those as biofuels in fuel cells that operate at room temperature, but we don't have catalysts to do that. We need better catalysts, obviously. So there's a lot, a whole bunch of other challenges, and I'm not going to go into them. The durability, cost, temperature of operation, so on. <clears throat> I'm going to zero in on, the, on a couple of other steps. So let me say what we're focusing on in the fuel cell part of the Energy Frontier Research Center, the FRC. Uh, lots of things. How are we going to define, how are we going to find new catalysts? It turns out that the theoretical understanding of catalysts and how catalysts work, especially in fuel cells, is so, uh, so what? Limited might be the right word that we're not likely to be able to sit down and design de novo from theory what, uh, what would be the right catalyst to build. We're going to have to discover it empirically as essentially all catalysts have been discovered empirically. So you, if you're going to do that, you're going to do it combinatorially. You want to do it fast. You want to look for lots of different catalysts. I'll tell you how you do that. If you're going to find a new catalyst, then you're going to have to develop methods to make nanoparticles out of them to have the same composition and all be small for reasons we already talked about. We don't know how to do that in the general case either. Lots of nanochemistry going on, but if you look at all the materials that have been made nano something or other, you know it's a few hundred. And there are millions of compounds out there. We don't know how to make nanoparticles out of it. A whole bunch of other things. Catalyst supports I mentioned, understanding all of this, blah, 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 blah. You can read it. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about all that stuff. I'm going to talk about just these top two. And then, then we'll, be at, we'll be at the end. So how do we do combinatorial studies? We don't make nanoparticles to start with. What we do is make thin films. We sputter on elements onto a substrate. And we take different sputter guns and aim them at different parts of a substrate. So here's a, a round wafer substrate. We have sputter gun A, B, C containing different elements, and we aim them so that A is mainly aimed there, B there, C there. It has kind of a plume so that if done right, the composition right in the middle will be one to one to one, A, B, C. Okay. So it, depending on your design, in this particular case, here's sputtering platinum, bismuth, and lead. If we look at what we expected to put on the substrate in terms of composition in a ternary phase diagram, Here's a, experimentally what we actually put on the substrate. We cover a good portion of the phase diagram on a single film. Okay. Now you take that film and you make it an electrode in an electrochemical setup. Now, whoops. This is uh, now how we're how we're doing this now is we can do up to five elements. This is just a fancy fancier picture than what I showed you before. What do we do? Ah, I skipped that slide. I took it out. What do we do? We take that film. We put it in electrochemical cell, when you oxidize a fuel, any fuel, you make H plus. That drops the pH. If you have dyes that fluoresce at low pH, you can pick out exactly where that's happening on the substrate. So just optically, you can look on that substrate and say, oop, that's the composition that works. Now you've got to take this and turn it into a nanoparticle. Okay? So the nanoparticles come next. You say, how am I going to take something that contains three, four, five elements Maybe a compound, it may be an alloy, it may be this, it may be that. How am I going to make it into a nanoparticle? So the way that we do it, at least at the laboratory scale, the way we do it is the way that's been developed for metal particles since Faraday's time, which is to put the metal cations in solution and reduce them. And you have to now, if you're going to do anything beyond a single element, you have to be very careful about how you do this. Otherwise, you're not going to make the particles homogeneous. So the first thing you have to worry about is co-reduction of different metals. Imagine we're, we're all different metals in this beaker, and I'm going to put a reducing agent in here. If the reducing agent's not strong enough, it only reduces some of you, and you might come together and precipitate out a solution. The rest is left around. That's not going to work. So we have to reduce everything, and we have to reduce everything at the same time. So if the, if the reduction rate for certain metals is too slow, all the other metals will get 
uh, precipitated out or form nanoparticles before the other metals are reduced. So you have to have the right precursors and the right reducing agents so that everything is, is uh, reduced on a time scale that's as fast as the diffusion time scale. So as the reducing agent is moving into the solution and going past, the diffusion front's going past all the metal ions, every one better be reduced. Then they have a chance to get together and make a homogeneous set of nanoparticles. So finding that condition and the set of precursors that allows that is a challenge. It's also a challenge if you want to use a wider and wider portion of the periodic table. So if you really want to explore what all the possibilities are, you have to go way to the left where things are very electropositive and want to react with water, way to the right uh, where it's difficult to reduce them because they're more electropositive. So you can't do most of this chemistry in water, for example, as, we've developed, as Faraday did for gold. You have to do it in solvents that can take that huge potential difference in, in reduction potentials. So you have to work away from water, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, then the particles have to nucleate and grow. You may want to control the growth. You may want to get particular uh, morphologies to the particles. You want them to produce particles that have very clean surfaces. Uh, that means you have to worry about the interactions of, uh, of these nascent metal clusters that are starting to grow with everything that's in the beaker. And it turns out everything that's in the beaker matters because you're only at room temperature and you don't need much of an interaction energy to get things to stick to the surface. And when things stick to the surface, they block the particles from growing or they can't grow properly. So you have to control all that chemistry. Then you worry about particle agglomeration and binding it to the supports. So when we make the particles, we want to keep the surfaces clean because they're going to be used as catalysts. Right? You don't want stuff on the surface that's blocking the catalytic activity. But if the surfaces are clean, when the particles collide, they're just going to stick together and the particles get too big and they eventually precipitate out of solution, depending on rates of reaction. So we, we have to do this with no surfactants, keep all the surface area active. We have to have the, typically the, the uh, catalyst support in the reaction beaker so that when the particles form, they bump into the catalyst support. They don't have, then they stuck to the catalyst support. They can't grow big. So all these kind of challenges, I won't go through the rest. So this is a, I'm just trying to give you an idea that this is a difficult process to do. And it's very difficult to control in the general case. But that's what we're, the chemistry we're trying to develop. OK. So let me give you a, an example of, uh, a simple example of, of preparing an important material. So Right now, the best material that can be used for the oxidation of formic acid is a compound, an intermetallic compound, that is an ordered structure of platinum and lead. Now, it's a problem because it has lead in it, because it wouldn't be accepted in the European market. Uh, so we're probably not going to use this, but it's the best one we've got at the moment. It's better than platinum and ruthenium by quite a bit. So here's an example of how we might make this. We take a platinum precursor. It has to be soluble in a certain solvent. Water's not a good solvent for this because water will react with the lead uh, when it's reduced. So plat platinum precursor is soluble in methanol. We had to build the appropriate ligands to get the lead to be soluble in the methanol uh, in, a, in, a, in a species that would be highly reactive. And so we built this special ligand. It's just a carboxylic acid with a, a, a polyether tail, which makes it soluble in in, the, in this particular solvent. In fact, this trick works for many metals in the periodic table. Just design the right ligand to, to keep it soluble. And in this particular case, we can use a reducing agent like sodium borohydride that's sufficiently reducing that both platinum and lead will be reduced pretty quickly with it. And it makes, without doing anything, it makes 10 nanometer particles in, in, uh, in the beaker at room temperature. And you can collect it right on the, on the support. I'll show you that in a bit. You can drop the particle size by being a little more clever. Uh, the BET surface area is quite small if you don't put in the support because the particles are so clean they agglomerate and stick together and get rid of most of the surface area. Nonetheless, you can find nanoparticles, 10 nanometer nanoparticles that you can do x-ray diffraction on, or excuse me, electron diffraction in a TEM and show that it's a single crystal particle. Okay? You can do in the same kind of apparatus in an STEM, you can do the chemical analysis and so on and so on. So you can prove that, in fact, you made what you wanted to make and that all the particles are homogeneous. Okay. 
So this is actually the picture I showed you earlier, and this is actually putting carbon black in with that synthesis mixture, and those particles are platinum lead particles on that, on that support. And you can see that most of the particles are down below, well below 10 nanometers, which is where we want it to be. So you capture them before they get very big and put them on the support. So in principle, we're lucky here because platinum lead likes to stick to carbon black. It does not stick well to uh, pure graphite or to carbon nanotubes. It sticks to carbon black because carbon black is not pure. It has a lot of functional groups on the surface, sulfur, carboxylic acid, aldehydes. It has all kinds of things on the surface that metals like to interact with, and that's why it sticks to the carbon black. So it's, uh, pure carbon is not the right thing to use, although pure carbon is a lot more thermodynamically stable. It doesn't corrode as fast as this. So it's a double dilemma. I can either have it not corrode, but the catalyst won't stick to it, or I can have the catalyst stick to it and it corrodes. So that's kind of a problem. All right, where are we? So let's just look at, just to show you if we, we do some electrochemistry. If, if we had a perfect catalyst for the oxidation of formic acid, it would start getting oxidized at this potential, and the current would rise almost vertically as you started increasing the potential. That is, there would be very little over potential for the oxidation of formic acid. So a perfect catalyst would do this, okay? Platinum and platinum ruthenium are 90 degrees away from that, okay? The best catalyst that was known actually for this before was palladium, and platinum lead does somewhat better. It's the best we got. It's still not perfect. It's a long way from what we need if we're gonna use formic acid as a, as a fuel because we're gonna use it at a reasonable current density. This is per square centimeter of catalyst surface. We're gonna use it at a reasonable current density. Right now, we would, up here, we would have an over potential of about 300 millivolts. That's too big. Five, 10 millivolts would be acceptable. 20 would be acceptable. Really push it 50 would be acceptable, but we don't have such a catalyst. Nonetheless, we can, we can make such catalysts and compare them with the, with the well-known nano catalysts that are out there already. Okay, so that's a simple example. If we're gonna get more complicated, ah, uh, before I do this. <clears throat> so now we wanna understand the mechanism of what's actually happening when you form nanoparticles in solution. And I said that everything in the solution matters. So you vary quite slightly what it is you're doing. Well, slightly, let's see. What we did is we made the same stuff but now we're gonna use a different platinum precursor. This is an organometallic precursor. We use the same lead precursor, and we do this in a solvent ethylene glycol, which is an ether-like solvent, at 25 degrees C, and we use sodium naphthalide as the reducing agent. It's a much stronger reducing agent than borohydride, so it should do much better at reducing the atoms as it goes by, and we wanna explore sodium naphthalide to use more electropositive metals like chromium and titanium, which sodium and naphthalide can reduce. <clears throat> so when we did it at room temperature, we found that the nanoparticles were tiny. They were just on the limit of resolution, about two nanometers, way too small, okay? What changed? Something changed in this. The clue came from uh, actually doing the reaction at room temperature and then heating the reaction vessel just by dropping it in a, in a warm solution and stirring for, I think it was 10 minutes. Uh, and nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened until we get to 110 C. At 110 C, all of a sudden, bam, the particles start growing, they get quite big. They get big very fast. Now that's a temperature that's way below sort of any metallurgical temperature. It has nothing to do with the platinum lead melting or anything like that. What it has to do with is the surface chemistry. What's stuck on the surface and when does it become thermally labile? When is it moving on and off the particle? When it's moving on and off the particle, the particles can now get together. So this was a clue, this was a first clue that said, ah, you know, we should have known this, but everything in the beaker matters. If stuff is sticking to the surface, you can't grow those particles. So here's a little cartoon of what we think, this is a busy slide, I think, yeah. Here's a cartoon of what we think is happening. So here's the precursor in solution, some metal anion in solution with maybe neutral ligands and anions around it, so this is the cation. Here's another metal, which I'll call Z, has different ligands, different anions perhaps. It's soluble in some kind of solvent, like an ether-like solvent, if we want to use things like titanium. We put in a reducing agent, which is sodium naphthalide. Sodium gives its electron to naphthalene, loses a little bit of activity, but it's about like using sodium as a reducing agent, which is pretty good. 
you put those together, and what happens? The very first step is this thing gets reduced. These get reduced to zero valent state, but they don't shed everything. All the things in solution still have some interaction energy with those atoms. And those things that might still be stuck to them include not only solvent and ligands, but possibly anions that might stick on these things. So it becomes a negatively charged species. Now that the slow step is for this stuff to come on and off so that these things can start nucleating and growing. And in the meanwhile, while they're growing, they still have stuff stuck around the surface. And anything and everything does stick on the surface. You have to control all that chemistry in order to produce exactly the right things that you want to produce. So that's a, that's a really big challenge. Okay. But it can be done. And I'll show you the first steps of getting there. Uh, so precursor selection makes a big difference. The anions in particular make a huge difference in what happens here. So here's platinum nickel as an intermetallic compound, one to one phase. It orders uh, to form an ordered structure at low enough temperatures. So let's look at platinum nickel as an example. And what I want to start with, I'll start with some platinum precursor. Here's the uh, uh, mixed organometallic chloride. Here's just pure chloride that's soluble in THF. And we're using a borohydride that's soluble in THF to reduce these two things and see what happens. When we do these precursors, mainly chlor all chloride here, some chloride here, a neutral uh, organic coordinating ligand here, uh, and then we take that product and we look at it in a TGA. We just heat it up and see what comes off. If you have nanoparticles, you expect some surface absorption from the air, a little bit of water, a little bit of this. So you expect some weight reduction when you heat it up in an inert, inert gas atmosphere. And sure enough, that's what happens. You lose a little bit of weight, but not a lot. But as soon as you go to other precursors, so here we use an organic uh, uh, anion, ACAC or acetonyl acetonate, so of platinum, uh, and acetyl acetonate of nickel, both soluble in THF, use the same reducing agent. Now you get this curve. You lose a huge amount of mass, and that mass is mostly carbonaceous stuff that's stuck on the surface, really bound strongly to the surface. And if we go finally to uh, to this one and change the reducing agent, so we keep the precursors the same, change the reducing agent, lose even more organic stuff. So there's all kinds of junk stuck all over the surface of these things, and those nanoparticles won't grow until you get rid of it. So one way you might get rid of it is to try to heat it up and drive it off thermally, but then you run into another problem. So here's all a summary of all of this. You heat it up and you, you do it in a tube, and you capture that organic product at high temperatures, it de is decomposing and forming a carbonaceous deposit all over the tubes that it's in. And that carbonaceous deposit goes all over the surface of the nanoparticles. Those nanoparticles that come out of there are beautiful looking from diffraction. They have the right size. They're catalytically absolutely dead because the surface is completely coated with graphite. With, well, I would say carbon. I can't say graphite. Completely coated with carbon. Whereas this species, under the same conditions, the tube is completely clear and it's catalytically active. So the carbonaceous species, if they're strongly enough bound, when you try to get them off, by thermal methods at least, they decompose and leave junk on the surface and you're dead. So what we've been doing is moving away from all organic anions. Some neutral organic ligands are okay, but we're moving mostly toward chlorides. Even chlorine sticks to the surface, but we know how to control that chemically. We can put in Lewis acids to attract the chlorine off the surface and actually make things that are extremely clean when we go just to chlorides. The trick there was to make, figure out how to make chlorides that are actually soluble in organic solvents. So ternary chlorides and beyond are, are what we're using. So here's just showing that as we make the samples, if we have all the organic stuff, there's some activity. But as soon as we heat it up, we get all that carbon coating on the surface, it's dead. Whereas what's made with the chlorine activities, we get some activity before we heat it up, but much more activity after we heat it up. We've got rid of all the, all the junk on the surface. So this is the really important key to understand all this mechanistic stuff in order to grow the nanoparticles. And that's, that's about where we're at. And so what we've learned is that all species that you put in solution, if you're trying to make nanoparticles, all the metal, metal species, when you reduce them to make metal zero, 
they, react, they can interact with everything that's in the beaker. That's really important to know and that you have to control what that is. You want to choose those species that have the lowest reactivity and binding energies with, with, the, with that ligand. <clears throat> so you can control it at or near room temperature. Uh, agglomeration of these small particles is possible, but only if the sur surface bound species are labile, if they're coming on and off. If they don't do that, they won't agglomerate, but they won't do anything else either. Uh, sometimes require some heating, as I gave you one example, at 110 degrees, things were labile enough to come off. Uh, sometimes you can use chemical techniques, but most often if, if we are going to do this, we require air free techniques to do it. This requires, these things are really oxygen and water sensitive because, so you have to deal with those with care, but we know how to do that. And so the challenge really is to continue to see if we can produce all the different kind of nanoparticles that we'd like to be able to produce across the periodic table with clean and electrocatalytically active surfaces. And we, I think we've more or less figured out the path to do that. Now we just have to do case after case after case to show that, that in fact it works and we can get somewhere with with good catalysts. So let me summarize that. So we started off with a really big picture, understood why it is we want to work on fuel cells and what the challenges were in fuel cells. And we boiled down in the end to say, if we've got to make much better catalysts, we don't know what compositions are going to be those catalysts, but we know we're going to have to have methods to synthesize those catalysts. And those methods now are being developed and it's working out. And we're working on really understanding those mechanistic details of the chemistry yet at the atomic level so that we can control exactly what we make and uh, what its activity will be. The combinatorial searches are helping us find better catalysts for a use uh, in a wider variety of fuels. I haven't told you about the best ones because I'm not allowed to yet, but th this is really working. Uh, we're happy about that. And then finally, the materials, chemists, materials scientists in general, anybody who works in materials have much to contribute to solving energy challenges on the planet not just in fuel cells, but in everything else that, that you look at. We're limited by materials in all of those endeavors. So I think that's it. Yep, that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll try to answer questions if you have some. Yes. Could you comment on the, the correlation? I understand that a lot of your focus is on the synthesis method, but um, Taking that a step further, see correlation between the catalytic activity for the three fuels that you mentioned, hydrogen, formic acid, and methanol. Is it, how, to what extent does catalyst perform well with one perform with the other? Um, hydrogen is a special case because it doesn't, if it's clean, it doesn't have to, you don't have to worry about carbon. So there are many more catalysts that work well with hydrogen than with the other fuels. But that caveat, um, we do see a trend that uh, with not only formic acid and methanol, but also with we also study other fuels to see if we can oxidize carbon-carbon bonds. And there, there are things that we, for the first oxidation step, it turns out to be easier with ethanol than with methanol. So the problem is that we don't fully oxidize the ethanol. So there, there are certain trends that we can see in, in, uh, in, in doing those things. But nothing that's... Um, Nothing that's clear enough at this point that says, this is the fuel you want to use, and that's the catalyst you want to use. We're not that far along yet. Yes? Question about the nanocomposite you mentioned. Yes. It has three functions. Yes. Uh, how about the structure of that nanocomposite? Is it like an amorphous material, or do you yeah. have so, some patterns? So it's, the way it's done right now in the technology is it's a, it's a simple formulation, like a paint for the wall. Okay, it's all just mixed together, it's put on, and as you would guess, it comes out in essentially amorphous structure. There's no periodicity to it. There's, there's a certain length scale for the porosity and so on. So one of the things that we're working on in the Fuel Cell Institute is to actually try to make self-assembled periodic structures. So we use block copolymers to try to organize all those pieces when they're painted on. And then we get rid of the block copolymers by chemical or other processes when we're done. So that's, that's an effort. What we're hoping to do in the long term is to develop techniques so that the electrode will completely self-assemble and every catalyst will be exactly at a triple junction between the three percolation networks so that every catalyst is precisely utilized and in exactly the right spot. So that's the dream and we're working toward that and making progress but we're not yet there.
Does that answer your question? Yes. Good. Thank you. Anything else? Jean. I, I thought you said that fuel cells were used in the space program. They are. Uh, what, what is, which cells are they using? They're using hydrogen and oxygen because they got it, right, on board, and it's very clean, number one. Number two, they're not using this fuel cell. This fuel cell, these fuel cells are all acidic, low pH fuel cells. What they're using is an alkaline fuel cell, and the, the reason they're using alkaline fuel cell is a bit esoteric, but we're also very interested in alkaline fuel cells because it's easier actually to do oxygen reduction under alkaline conditions. Alkaline conditions have other problems for general commercial use. If you breathe air, CO2 reacts with the alkaline medium to make carbonates. So you have to get all the CO2 out of the air if you're breathing oxygen in from the air. Nonetheless, that technology may be simpler to do to remove, scrub out the CO2 and allow us to make a better catalyst for oxygen reduction than doing things under acidic conditions. So we're also looking under alkaline conditions, but I haven't talked about that at all. So, the other thing about the, the NASA fuel cell is it a, a costs several, mil, several million dollars to make, and their objective is not cost, their objective is reliability. So every time a shot goes up, the fuel cell operates, comes back down, the fuel cell is torn down, completely rebuilt. Okay, so it operates for, you know, a week, maybe two weeks, comes down, completely rebuilt. You can drive a fuel cell car now from GM, and I've driven several of them. Uh, they're, they drive, wonder, they're like driving a Prius. They feel the same as a Prius. They, no sound, no nothing, you know, whatever. Uh, but each car right now, because they're handmade and whatever, costs about a million and a half. A bit too expensive for most of us. So the cost is going to come way down. Some of that will come with just the production scale. But if they don't get the efficiency above 50%, nobody's ever going to invest the, the money to do it. So we need, be, we need to do all this stuff. To, for that to happen. And then we'd like to use a much wider variety of fuels. So we've got to, we've got to figure out how to do that as well. So it's a technology in a way that's a long way off for this particular market. The high temperature fuel cells are much closer, but they're not going to be used in transportation. Yeah. Could you comment on the reaction mechanism and why platinum lead works so well uh -huh. for forming acid oxidation? Well, that's a that's a million dollar question. And I can tell you what hypotheses we have now discarded. I can't tell you that we have one hypothesis which is now proven to be the only way to look at it. So there's a whole bunch of things that I've swept under the rug. Um, one of which is that if you make a nanoparticle of anything and you take it out and you expose it to air, the surface isn't going to be what you think it is. Even platinum and gold, if you take it out and expose it to air, will quickly absorb things from the air, especially sulfur-containing compounds, and they'll be all over the surface. Uh, if it's almost any other metal in the periodic table or a compound containing any of those metals, like platinum and lead, then the, the more electropositive element, when it gets out in the air and the water, will oxidize. So the surface of the particle is actually oxidized. And how deep into the surface it's oxidized depends on the compound and the conditions and how it gets exposed to air and so on. But it's often a nanometer or so thick. So the catalyst that we're looking at, the real surface, is not just platinum and lead. It's got platinum, lead, and oxygen at least in it. Okay? And we don't know what the composition is. And we know that we can manipulate that oxide by electrochemical methods, so if we run the potential quite negative and generate hydrogen at the surface, we reduce some of that oxide and it changes the catalytic activity, actually improves the catalytic activity. Uh, but we know we're not back to pure platinum lead. So when I say we have a platinum lead catalyst, platinum lead is what we start with. What the true catalyst is on the surface, we don't know. Since we don't know what that true catalyst is, it's very hard to figure out what the mechanism is. And furthermore, we don't have good tools for determining what is the surface composition. We, don't, we haven't developed the tools for that kind of surface analysis on nanoparticles. So what we do is we grow single crystals of platinum lead and we study them by surface techniques in using the synchrotrons and other, other methods to try to determine what that is. And we're making some progress, but it's, there's still no, we don't really know the composition, which makes it difficult to know exactly what the mechanism is. We know it works. We know under what conditions it works best, but that's about as far as we can go at the moment. So this is, 
It's unlike you know, uh, typical surface chemistry, surface physics research, which is ultra high vacuum, really clean. This is ultra dirty, in solution, and that's what you have to understand if you're going to understand the fuel cell. So it's relative to methanol oxidation uh, instead of forming acid. Me it's not very good for methanol. Platinum bismuth is much better. <laughs> so, I don't, and we don't know why. Yes. I, I really encourage by you know developing tools to look over, as you said, the periodic table. Yeah. Uh, and then the cat catalyst side, platinum is the archetype, obviously, from which we start. Uh, will we ever see a non-carbon support? Oh yes, we're working on that for sure. So I didn't talk about the support work we're doing, but we already have some materials that are looking pretty promising. Uh, not, not other forms of carbon. Not other forms. Of, other people are working on other forms of carbon, and, and that's not our expertise, so we're not working there. But uh, uh, some oxides and some nitrides both look at, look promising. Question about the, the overpotential. I'm, uh -huh. I'm not in this field. So, yeah. is there any general direction to reduce you know, from uh, theoretical uh, guidance to reduce this? What's the optimal uh, material property that will reduce minimize this overpotential? Um, so if you, if you study electrochemistry or any kind of kinetic uh, models, kinetic models always have two states with some kind of activation barrier between, right? Whether it's electrochemical or not. If you want to get a very good catalyst, you want that activation barrier to be as small as possible so that the rates of going back and forth across there are very high. That's really what you're shooting for. You want the turnover rate when a, when a Molecule hits that surface, you want that reaction to be very fast, and then another molecule comes in. That's what you're looking for. That gives you low overpotential. If you've got a big barrier, you get high overpotentials. It's, that, it's more or less that simple. You can state it simply, but to design, again, to design a material de novo that will do that, I don't think anybody really knows how to do it. It's too complex because you have a surface that's often not just the termination of the bulk, as I mentioned, could be oxidized. You've got water, a high dielectric constant. You've got other things, acid, and other things in solution. It's a very complex environment. It's very hard to even simulate what that interface looks like at the atomic level and get it right. I think uh, uh, it's OK. Let's take a last question. Um, you mentioned the synthesis is very important. Have you or are you aware of anyone else who's looked at electro the electrodeposition methods for making these nanoparticles? Yeah, there are people who are trying to use electrodeposition. Uh, making nanoparticles that way is a little more challenging than making films, for example. More often, people are interested in making uniform films by electrodeposition. You can make nanoparticles. Sometimes what you do is make additives so that the particles get stuff on the surface, keeps them from agglomerating. Uh, we like to avoid that. But p people are making dendritic structures and other things by electrochemistry. Uh, we're not exploiting that as a tool at the moment. Uh, it, it may be, pro I think there's plenty of room for people to explore different methods to, to make the uh, appropriate catalyst for this stuff, and it's not clear to me that the one we're using is the optimal one. It's one that we can explore in the laboratory under a wide variety of conditions with a wide variety of metals, different solvents, and different reducing agents. So that's where we're playing at the moment. I think probably this, you know, even if we learn how to make nanoparticles this way to do the, make the right nanoparticles, this isn't what you do in industry. I don't think it's scalable to a huge quantity of stuff. So you're going to have to come up with other methods at some point. But we need to do the proof of principle that if you can do this, then you can so on and so on before someone will invest in finding out how to do it otherwise. I think we have plenty of time for the social and social hour. And uh, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Again. Thank you all. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Hello. Very, very interesting talk. Thank uh, you. I enjoyed it.